Hi everyone, I'm Gabriel Pereira. I am your host of A Modern Animal. In this podcast, myself and my friend, Dr. Mike Woodrow, will be digging into all things related to the life of a modern animal. Cats, dogs, horses, and the occasional fish, we will cover it all, building on Mike's more than 35 years of experience as a veterinary surgeon in Australian country practice, uh, suburban practice, and more recently as the owner of businesses across the pet care space. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of A Modern Animal. I am your co-host, I don't want to say I'm the host, I'm your co-host Gabe Pereira with my esteemed colleague, companion and friend Dr. Michael Woodrow. Great to be here. Today we have almost another doctor, is that right Shiva? Yes. Dr. Shiva Greenhalgh, um, animal nutritionist, uh, veterinary science master's degree holder and is it fair to say dog food specialist is that a is that a fair summation or am I being too simplistic oh I do companion animals so it's cats and dogs and um poultry but I'm moving away from poultry too so um, sure, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna read through a little bit of your bio here, which is which is amazing. And firstly, thank you very much for your time. I know you're you, from what we said earlier, you're almost ready to press submit on your PhD. Is that right? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Incredible. Yeah. Incredible. Um, Shiva, as I said earlier, is a registered and practicing animal nutritionist with a focus area on companion animal, animals and poultry. Shiva's done a Bachelor of Arts from Australian Natural University, National University of Australia, followed by a Bachelor of Science in Zoology from Western Sydney Uni. She's done a Master's in Animal Science with a specialisation in animal nutrition at University of Sydney and is, as we said, currently in her final phase of completing a PhD at University of Sydney. Um, Shiva, you've worked across commercial product development, private practice, um, and now I believe you're currently heading up animal nutrition at Pet Circle. Is that right? Yes. Yes, so I look after um, all facets of nutrition there um, for their you know, private label and just generally nutrition and assist with content and, yeah, things like that. So And Pet has yeah. been this incredible um, growth story in our industry, hasn't it? Absolutely. It definitely has, yeah, yeah. They started you- yeah, 11 years ago and they've grown to one of the biggest one of the biggest online retailers in Australia. So, yeah. And they're, they're, I mean, from what I understand about Mike and the team, they're desperately passionate about pets as well, which is Oh, great. definitely. Yeah, they are. They are. <laughs> and, 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 and it is all about, and it is genuinely all about pets and making sure that pets come first and foremost. Yeah. Um, so that's their absolute core focus. Yeah. Yeah. And so, Chiva, I just wanted to um, acknowledge that while, while some of us may have had a, uh, a desire or perhaps a dream to do a PhD, you're actually doing it. And this, uh, you know, ab- absolute respect to you for, for totally. taking that journey. Thank you. So I, I um, like, sounds like Mike, like you, another, another yeah. dark shared secret. So I, I started one with Southern Cross Uni Shiva and yeah. just I couldn't do the kids plus work plus PhD yeah. journey. Yes. So hats off to you. It's just, it's... um. It's a massive undertaking. I mean, I think it's absolutely an incredible achievement. Just, yeah, in, it in is, context, but I, I, it's yeah, And I don't deny it's, it is an incredibly difficult thing to do um, and there are definitely sacrifices that are made, whether that be time spent on yourself or with your family or with your children. Yeah. Um, and I recently had my third child born in January, so she's about oh four gosh. months old. Um so without help and um yeah certain sacrifices it just mm. so it's very hard it's very very difficult yeah but clearly that's uh those are sacrifices that are driven by passion uh, absolutely passion. Yeah. yeah and that's that, I'm, I'm assuming that's that's some of the focus of our conversation today yeah that's so right. i i want to dig into that actually because we've yeah. done that a couple of times mike haven't we so she we are going to talk about animal nutrition and, and specifically companion animal nutrition in a second but talk to us about your your life with animals yeah. and and you know mike and i have both got crazy animal stories i'm sure you've got a million but <laughs> what what's your background why 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 animals in particular uh, so it was, look the way that i got here was definitely not linear it was very much a roundabout way that i got here um i had obviously like most of us that are involved with animals loved it since childhood although um 
my cultural background was not for females getting involved in that. It was, they thought, well, that's more of a male dominant role to do. Yeah. Um, so I was, my parents encouraged me to go do things like humanities. So I went and did that um, as my first undergraduate degree, but it certainly was not something that I was interested in. I always wanted to revert back to animals. Um, and even growing up, it was very difficult to even get a pet, but I would still bring animals, um, <laughs> although my parents would then take them back. I would take them back to a vet <laughs> clinic and say, please rehome them. Um, but essentially, when I got my first proper cat when I was about 16 years old, I was allowed to have him. Um, I didn't know a thing about nutrition, what to do, and we just followed along with what the breeder told us to go along with. Yep. But even as a teenager, I could see that this was not the correct diet. Um, I could see mm. he was not thriving as well. Um, the, the breeder had told us to feed mints in a very low quality um, grocery type of food. Yep. Um, and so I, I saw that, that that wasn't actually a good a good diet. Um, so we went and asked our vet, you know, what's a good diet? I, the vet gave us some ideas, but they said, look, my background is not in nutrition. And so I was very curious by this and I noticed there really weren't any specialists in this area. So, I mean, if I were to go back, that's really where it started for me. Um, and then, you know, once I finished my first undergraduate and not wanting to do very much with that, I, I took my stance and said, I'm going to, I'm going to start this, this journey yeah. and see yeah. how, and so um, that's really where it all started. So when I was 22 years old, I started my, um, science and zoology degree and have you know since then been doing all things with um animals and it's just been the best the best journey so yeah and here we are now love it and are you seeing i mean what's what was the because you were in practice for a period of time what was the the sort of split in terms of the types of animals you saw was it people coming interesting it's for... predominantly dogs Yep. It's predominantly dogs. But dogs with but, issues or dogs with just very engaged owners trying to figure out how to no, do dogs with feeding. issues. Okay. Dogs with issues. And the biggest issue, many would think it would be obesity. That said, I do get, but the predominant one is actually kidney disease. And it seems oh, to be more prevalent than people realize. Yeah. Um, so that's the biggest issue that actually comes my way. And it's owners who are not they want to see if there's another way of feeding their animal aside from um, feeding just a commercial kibble yep. food um, because for them they feel that um, the diet is bland and dull and they want their animal, their mm -hmm. dog, to have get enjoyment from their food. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's a mixture of it's trying to get a right balance between meeting the needs given their condition and also giving them a sense of joy when they eat. Yeah. Um, so that's why they come to me to see, is there a way that we can work around it? Yeah. So what, what's the journey for someone? So, so I imagine, well, I think what I'm seeing now, because you, you see this, this, this trend towards dehydrated, air dried, freeze dried, fresh, yeah. raw, frozen, etc. Yeah. Right. So we've, We've got a dog child. I know Mike has a dog child as well. Um, Mike, you've got cat children as well, I think. Um, <laughs> and poultry. And poultry, poultry chicken <laughs> children. <laughs> Just for you, Sheila. Um, we've made, so, so you get the dog. We were living overseas when we got our dog. The easiest thing in the world at that stage, because we were actually in China, was the highest quality kibble that I could carry in my luggage allowance on the plane back from Australia. Yeah. <laughs> so it was, a, it was a 10 kilo suitcase and a 30 kilo bag of dog food <laughs> <laughs> every month coming back. Um, and that was the best we could do. Right. And we had considerations around stool consistency, you know, all of those kind of things walking the streets of Shanghai. Um, since returning to Australia, you know, we've, we've had our dog child on raw. So brands like Bath and big dog and, and so on um we can't we, we can't swing the family budget to get Lyca in there although we'd love to we'd love to use like <laughs> um, yeah um what but I, I must be honest with you we had a crack at trying to figure out the macronutrients micronutrients for doing our own raw and we were inspired by the 400 different instagram accounts that my partner follows and you know <laughs> but it was it was honestly like if i can if i can prepare home cooked meals for myself and the family 
that's a that's a big tick adding in the dog on top was actually just a bridge too far yeah. um yeah. and i reckon that's you must hear that a lot right yeah um it so what biggest, is, yeah. what do you rec- what do you recommend to people how do how do we approach this it's very much a case by case I, I don't say it's a one size fits all at all. And when I talk to clients as well, what's really important for me, I obviously, I need to do for first and foremost, what's right for the dog, given say their condition, if there are no conditions, you know, it's, it's, we've got more flexibility. Um, but I do know, I mean, obviously with commercial foods, they are complete and balanced. And by complete, we mean that it has all the nutrients and by yep. balanced, we mean that it's got it in the right ratios. Um, often we'd say raw and home cooked it might have all the nutrients so we could say yes it's complete but it is definitely not balanced yeah got it um so that's a really important distinction so you know I'd like to I always like to find out what the owners want um and I try and work with that um and I try and work with what is realistic as far as accessibility to ingredients their time and just really highlight that it is a big effort that needs to be made consistently and if they want to do that I will work with them to do that Um, but I like to also let them know that they don't need to feel guilty if they need to do commercial foods in the mix whether that be kibble or wet because at the end of the day both our goal is that animal to be fed correctly Um, it's kind of like with women and breastfeeding, for instance. Yeah, um, personal choice, this, right, at the end of the yeah, day. Yeah, it's personal choice, but people shouldn't be shamed if they don't want to do breastfeeding, for instance, yeah. and if they want to do formula. So it's whatever works well for you and what your dog enjoys. You know your dog best. And if they're not going to eat kibble, well, they're not going to be getting those nutrients. So let's work out another way of making sure to that they're going to get up. those nutrients. Yeah. So um, it's very much case by case. Um you know, for instance, I have, do have people, though, that want to do raw, and that is okay for an adult healthy dog. But if someone who brings a dog and says to me, I want to do raw, but the dog has kidney disease, yeah. I'm very adamant to say, no, that is not the right way to do it because you will only worsen it. Um, so it's a lot of education. We try and find a balance between it, but then there are times where you just need to be quite frank and say, well, this is not going to work and it's not going to be in the interest of your dog. So very much case by case, yes. So let, let me, sorry, I'm, I'm asking a lot of questions, but this is an area of interest for me. So let, let's let's talk, because I think what we try and do with this, to the extent we can, Chiba, is be as, as evidence-based as possible, right? And so, yes. as you say, unapologetically kind of say, okay, science is a moving feast. We all recognise and accept that. Um, and the science is always evolving. But based on what we know about physiology, about biochemistry, about you know, the preponderance of evidence on this particular topic at this point in time, this is what we believe is the right answer, right? Um, What, let's talk a couple of things. So if I may, what do you use as far as diagnostic tools? Are you, are you doing stool analysis, microbiome analysis, bloods, symptomology? What's, what's the approach? Yeah. So once again, it depends on the condition. There are some conditions you don't need to look, but for dogs that have particular conditions, I'll just go back again to kidney disease, just because it's easier. Um, I require blood results and I look at that. I see what the notes are because there are different stages of kidney disease and depending on that stage, then we know how to approach it. Um, And then also we do have some dogs, for instance, that um, will end up with kidney disease from birth. So that's a congenital issue. So we need to deal with that very, very early on to kind of um, depress or stop it from... um, progressing at a rapid rate um so it really depends what the condition is there are some people for instance if they they say that their dog has a sensitivity to a certain protein and things like that there are i mean allergy tests can be done they're not so accurate for dogs so then the best way to do it is through elimination but that is quite a lengthy process It's it's quite hard so it really depends what what the condition is, um, and then based on that, there will, we can you know I would have to speak to the vet and say, well, I think that this should be done, or I'll tell the owner directly to tell their vet these are the kind of tests that should be done, or these are the markers that I'm interested in, um, and then we'll come back and then work out a way from there. Um, so yeah, it really depends on the condition. Um, 
with the microbiome, for instance, that's a very interesting one. People are showing quite a lot of interest in gut mm. health and how that affects dogs. But what you've got to understand with the microbiome is that that can change almost on a day-to-day depending on what's e- what's eaten. Um, so that's a little bit more difficult. But, um, yeah, obviously diet really does does matter. And if they're quite consistent, we can get some idea. But at this stage, I haven't done too many things with um, – microbiomes and having that analyzed for for people the biggest issue of actually um issues of diabetes issues of kidney disease um, and weight loss are probably the biggest ones so mm. yeah. yeah and so so those are those are dogs i guess and we should talk about cats too mike um yeah. dogs that have considerations around a particular condition or a particular issue what about just people so the only problem my dog's got is anxiety. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and she's shedding a bit. So, but I still want, like anyone, I want the very best for her, right? What, yes. You know, again, without any sort of limitation, I walk into your clinic or I walk, I see you in the coffee shop. What do you recommend? And I know every dog's different, but again, for a generally healthy dog, pretty active, what, what should I be thinking about as far as feeding considerations? Look, so in that regard, I, I, I'm not going to say yes, raw, yes, cooked, yes. Yeah. Yes. So I would be asking you firstly, well, what are you currently feeding and how's that going? For how's that you? going? Got it. Yeah. How's that going for you? Um, does your dog look unhappy when you're feeding it? Because, you know, a lot of the time people will put down kibble and the dog looks up and goes, oh, really? what's this? <laughs> and so, and then so things like toppers are required. Yep. And then I'll, so there's a whole host of questions that I want to and need to ask you. I go, well, do they have a preference for, say, eggs, for instance? Do they like that? So maybe try some boiled egg. Different things to, so I, so saying to me what's the best thing to feed, first and foremost, I'll say it needs to be complete and balanced, whether that's yep. a kibble, a wet food, raw, whatever. It needs to be complete and balanced. But then I'll ask you, what's your dog's preference? What have you found that they like most? Yep. Um. So yeah, it'd be it'd probably be a more lengthy conversation Got um, it. as opposed to a quick here. I, so you, I so recommend this. If I'm hearing you correctly, you you're somewhat agnostic around the food type. Is that is that fair to say? Very much so. Very yeah. much so. And yeah. I think and I think it seems like it's dog and owner preference first and foremost, unless there is a specific health consideration to take into yes. account. Yes. Is that is that a good summary? That is correct. That's how I approach approach it, okay. um, everything. Yeah. Cool, which I, th- which I think is a great approach and probably Mike would echo your own, I think, right? Yeah. And I'm, I'm wondering if this is a, a helpful segue to perhaps to look at cats. And, you know, I, mm. I, your reference to kidney conditions in dogs, naturally kidney conditions in cats is as a degenerative um, condition is, um, it, is a really significant problem. What successes have you found in, in that area from a dietary management point of view? Yes, so cats are a a little bit more difficult, particularly if you're wanting to do home cooked because they're quite, they're definitely fussy. This is a big issue. Um, And what I have found with cats, perhaps the best method is putting them on a commercial food because that's a guarantee that we're going to reduce that, um, reduce that progress of the kidney disease. Um, and but the other thing is also owner compliance as well. So you'll have owners uh, like with cats as well, um, particularly where they go, well, my cat doesn't particularly like this kibble or not eating so much. What else can I do? And so I'll recommend um, cats are very big on broths as well. They like to lick up things. So yeah. um, and with kidney disease, you know, you can still give meats, giving high quality meats, but boiling is a very good way. Yeah. of trying to introduce or give meats as well. Um, so it's trying to work around. Board. And then you have some cats that will just eat anything and everything. That's very rare, but uh, rare. but it does. Yeah. Um, and so I guess, yeah, th- that's that's the best way that I kind of deal with it as far as. But I've had mainly dogs with the cats with the kidney disease. Um, I've only had a few. And I found that with cat owners, they don't come as much to seek dietary advice as much as dog owners um i guess there are certain limitations with what they can eat as well 
And often with owners, if they can find a food that the cat will eat, they just kind of stick to it. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, but obviously, you know, there are some owners that go, well, what more can I do because they won't eat this kibble or they won't eat this wet food? So it's with the cats, it's more about trying to find a topper that will help them eat that commercial food. Yeah. Um, cats would rather starve themselves than. Yeah. So th- there, yeah. there is the saying that um, dogs have masters, cats have slaves. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> and so, I mean, so oftentimes as as my cat's slave, um, it has to be a fairly pragmatic approach. It's like, whatever you desire. What, yeah. <laughs> what is your wish, my Lord? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you for that anyway, Shiva. That's helpful. Yes. Um, Shiva, I want to I want to circle back if I can and double click on complete and balance. So assume that I'm a just a regular lay person. What does that mean to me? So so is it so putting aside delineation between raw, air dried, kibble, <laughs> fresh, whatever, yes. what what am I looking for? So um obviously budget's one consideration, and I think that's probably very important. Yes. In sort of 2022, people are probably balancing the books a lot more than perhaps they were in previous years. Right. Um, what, do, what do I look for? So I, I walk into the supermarket or I walk into a pet special, you know, into a pet barn or a, a pet stock. What am I looking for? So there are different categories of foods, obviously. So I guess, okay, so we have complete and balanced, and then we also have complementary. So these okay. are, the, I guess, two kind of things. So complete and balanced is as I've said to you before, it's the food has the right nutrients that the animal needs. So these are based on a macro and micro level. So these yep. are energy. So there are energy requirements that they have that need to be met. There are the micronutrients. So these are vitamins, minerals, and fats. Yep. And then the balance side of it is all these nutrients are in the correct ratio. So we're not having too much of something or too little. Got they're it. meeting they're meeting these requirements and on packaging they'll have the minimum amounts that are, are in that food um but that's and that's generally point. per the apvma standard right um there are actually no regulations in australia so with oh, them okay. they only deal with if there is a product that has a chemical in it but with food there is actually no regulation in australia in australia if if anyone does manufacture food they often go off the afco Yep. guidelines there is also the european fidiaf so this is a really big issue in Interesting, australia hey? um yes but that said look because there's um, this funny i mean and you know a lot a lot more about this than i do sorry to interrupt you there's this <laughs> very significant overlap between livestock food stock and companion animal regulation in australia isn't there yes and yeah. it's not entirely helpful <laughs> yes so with pets you know with the livestock that's that's going into the human food chain. So there's yep. definitely more regulation with there. that. But yep. with the pet food, there isn't, and pets are viewed as property still yep. um, legally. Um, so there's a lot that needs to change legally. Um, and I know that there would be people in the background trying to get something going. Um, there's yep. been a lot of petitions and a lot of calls for this change to occur. I think we have a very long way to go for that. To, I would be that said. I would be very surprised if five years down the line we still haven't had anything in place. Yep. Um, that would be very surprising and disappointing. Um, but uh, most manufacturers in Australia, I know, and with startups, they do really try to do the right, the thing. right thing. They try sure. to do, the, and they they really do like to do their due diligence. Um, so there is, I, I do trust a lot of, um, I know there's a lot of cynicism about pet food manufacturing. And today, I must say a lot of them, they do a lot of research and development. It's not, say, 20 years ago um, where there probably were a lot of issues. Now there's yeah. a lot of regulation, particularly in Europe and the US. So they need to do right. And they need to do right by the animals. So I think people need to um, feel a bit more rest assured. That said, there's always going to be variability in yeah. the foods and, and that happens all the time in even the human food chain. There's always going to be variability in quality Absolutely. assurance and things like that. But um, So does it come company, down to brand in the end, in your opinion? So, look, with premium brands, so um, we have premium, we have budget. Yeah. With the ones, say, from supermarkets, um, you know, some of them are manufactured overseas and 
they also formulate to something called least cost formulation. I mean, that happens yep. all in any across industry. Animal yep. <laughs> um, <clears throat> and they're more likely to change ingredients depending on cost. Yep. Um, and that also will cause some variability actually in the nutrients, whether they're meeting targets or not. Yep. With more premium mm. ones, they're more uniform. So they're going to stick to one supplier a lot of the time and they're going to be using the same ingredients. So there's an assurance that when it says chicken, it's going to actually be chicken and it's going yeah. to be from that supplier and it's going to have that correct amino acid profile. Whereas with the budget ones, it's very much based on the cost at the time. Yeah. Um, whereas the premium ones, it's going to be quite uniform. So you know batch each batch each time will be the same as the previous one. Yeah, I mean, one. this is, I guess, just as a quick side note, this is something I guess a lot of pet parents don't understand, which is that mm-hmm. animal feed materials are international global commodities, which are traded <laughs> like, yes. like wheat, corn, et cetera, right? So yes. gold, whatever. Yeah. Um, yeah. So to, your, so- to your point, it's, it's, you know, what's the spot the spot rate on chicken this, this month? You know, okay, great. We're getting it from Australia this month or wherever. Yeah, um, and and the prices change a lot. Even I, uh, soy is probably one of the biggest, yeah. most expensive um, commodities. Uh, but yeah, the prices can change, do change. But from what I understand, with the premium foods, despite this change, the cost may increase on the shelf for you because they've yep. had to take that cost on. But there is uniformity in um, the ingredients that they're using with the more premium ones. Yep. The other side of it with the budget ones, um, less so. Yeah. So okay, so I'm not going to ask you to call out any brands, of course, but um, let's do the let's do the dark side of the force. Um, what are the what are the watch outs for again for that normal person in the street who's walking in to buy cat or dog food? Yeah. Brands aside, right? So let's assume there's some great lower priced as well as some great premium brands out there because I think there absolutely are. Um, what are the watch outs? Because maybe that's the way to kind of make the decision easier. Yeah. People. So with the ingredients, um, try to avoid ones that have different proteins listed. So if it goes and or beef and or chicken, because uh, if okay. it's a labeled chicken, but then if it's cheaper at the time to get beef, then you're beef. not actually getting chicken. <laughs> it's beef is cheaper. That's the biggest, that's the biggest okay. thing for me. Okay. And that's where I compare with premium. It'll always just stay as chicken. There's no and if it's chicken, it's chicken. Yeah, got it's it. Chicken, it's chicken, it's okay. chicken. Um, and also people I didn't need know that, to be honest. Yeah, people need to understand as well, there's this big thing of, oh, meat needs to be the first ingredient and so on. Um, yeah, that's good. But grains also play a very big role as well. Grains are quite important for, yeah. at least for dogs. Cats can also utilise it um, to Is that a right? degree. Yes, they can to a degree. So what it does is it just allows the cat um, to get another energy source without having to use all the protein. Yep. Um, but with dogs, they're, they're able to utilise it much more better, so they have evolved to. And grains have, um, they've got good vitamin and mineral content. They've got good amino acid profile. Wheat has a great amino acid profile. Um, and it's a good source of fiber. So people should not be discrediting grains. Um, they do, they just very it's definitely much fallen, fallen out of favor now, hasn't it? The, the, the rise of grain free is very prolific. Yeah, it's actually now declining a bit. Is it? Um, okay. and, and, and it had to do a lot with the um, DCM issue. But now um, I've noticed there are some brands that are now marketing that grain is back. And grain is, grain is very much a good thing. It is a functional ingredient. Yep. very much a functional ingredient and having too much of protein having too much of meat is also not a good thing as well that also leads to weight gain um and with excess protein as well it doesn't it just gets excreted. the impact on the kidney i guess is also there to consider as well if right? they're prone to it if they're yeah. prone to it there's there are uh, kidney disease come about um through different ways but um dental dental issues for instance yes yeah, for sure dental health is very important with um the future likelihood of kidney disease people mm-hmm. don't realize that so she but just thinking about vitamins and minerals i had two questions one was um do you tend to see um a higher level of salt or or other mm-hmm. flavor enhancers in in the, your more budget foods or is that something to be washing out for or be concerned about 
I, it's difficult to say because I don't have to really um, put the percentage right. um, in there, but they would likely put in higher amounts of certain palatins. Um, it could be higher in fat because yeah. that's used as a palatin. Um, so, yeah, you would want to look out for the fat amount as well, especially if your animals, say, predisposed to pancreatitis. Those budget foods could definitely flare that up. Um, but it's difficult to say without looking at their actual specs. They can just yeah. list salt. They don't have to necessarily put the amounts per se. Yeah. Sure. And then um, I was also thinking about, um, you know, you're talking about a complete and balanced and, and thinking about, um, I guess, a bioavailability of some of the micronutrients and, and you know, the impact that um, heat or um, processing might might have on that. So, yeah. you know, yeah. the, I guess what I'm thinking about is lab analysis of vitamins and minerals versus um, animal access. Any thoughts there? Yeah. So um, once again, kind of going back to premium, they've, you know, there's really great technology out there where they've created these vitamins and minerals that can be put in through extrusion at quite high temperatures yeah. without that being destroyed. Um, once again, that depends on the supplier, but they've come up with pretty good technology to reduce that. Sometimes they might spray that on at the end of the, the end, extrusion right. process, but um, I, I do know that that can be put in with the other dry ingredients without that being destroyed. Um, so they've obviously come up with really good technical, technological ways of um, stopping that. Um, so that's really good. Um, but Look, and people get really worried. They go, oh, you know, there are additives and things like that. But what you've got to understand about additives, so these additives, your vitamins, minerals, it can be amino acids. They're quite good because the animal is then able to easily and rapidly utilise those. If you're just getting it from the ingredients, it takes a lot for it to try and break down and that well, may only yeah. utilise yeah. 40 to 60%. It's not going to take it all in. So um, those additives are a lot better as far as utilization goes compared to trying to extract that from the ingredient per se mm. interesting so where's where's the future of animal food going do you think um well i was recently reading that and i think it's a generational thing for millennials like myself um they're always looking for alternate ways of feeding people are into wanting to feed variety and there's this concept of rotational feeding yeah so we're coming so say my parents generation it was very much food out of the bag yep um but now you know we're wanting to provide variety whether that's in the form of taste texture smell because we understand that eating food it's an enjoyable experience it's a, sensory experience, it's right? a completely sensory and yep. and and we see that with our dogs whenever they're allowed to have a little bit of our food or yeah, just they go wild. Yeah. <laughs> it just makes the world of difference yeah. to them. You can see that happiness and um, it gives a sense of vitality to them. So I think that's where, you know, the pet food owners are going down the track of particularly millennials and generations thereafter. Yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm wondering whether we'll, I'm wondering if we'll see the rise of, um, you know, like uh, a weekly a weekly delivery of you know seven different meal types so tuesday's palmy night it's happening and, uh, you it's know happening. It could, marley's yeah. food's doing it right yeah so, yeah yeah and you know it can be things of it could almost be almost like a light and easy thing of pick yes. your breakfast pick your lunch pick yeah. your dinner and uh, and a dessert um but you know people may think that this is silly and but i actually think it's a nice thing to do for pets because i was once asked they said do you think nutrition is the main foundation for happy, healthy pets? It, it plays a big role, but the environment and, yes, the food and it, giving that enjoyment to the dog, yeah. it does it, it alleviates even anxiety issues in yeah. my view. Yeah. They've got this food. It makes them happy and the way that it's presented and um, just all of those things, you know, they eat with their eyes as well, so... I, th I think it's really important um, how we present food to them and even yeah, the temperature that it's given to. And yeah. 
Yeah. It's interesting, isn't it? Because you, you you think, well, what is you know, in, if you came right back to the to the why? What's the purpose? Surely our the purpose of pets in our lives is is a relational, yeah. um, and both for them and for us. Um, and and imagine if one of the major parts of our interaction with them, especially um, in what might be a, the number of hours of interaction might be reducing. Yes. So we need to increase the quality of, of the interaction time we have. Much of that is going to be around, um, so it could be around exercise, it could be around, but it's certainly around feeding. And then feeding is, is, is a very transactional process where it's really just you know, portioning and presenting. Imagine if you change that to like some element of creating and sharing, you know, that, that that's the, right. Yeah, the, the and, relational and quotient them, goes I, right up. That's right. I tell a lot of owners with pets that are not keen to try new things. I actually say just sit down on the floor with them, just yeah. sit down on the ground next to their bowl. I love that. Encourage them, pat them. I know because I've had to do this with my own dog who has their own anxiety issues and is not keen <laughs> to try new things. So whatever <laughs> I tell people, I have tried this with my own dog. Yes. And it, and it really makes a world of difference in how they view food time in how you view food time, because I think a lot of pet owners can get anxious around feeding, yeah. um, but you need to be experimental. Um, the dog, pick, the dog or the cat picks up on that anxiety straight away exactly. as well. Exactly, yeah. So I, I encourage pet owners to be experimental. This is your pet. They have feelings. This is your family member. So just do trial and error. This is a relationship. It's um, So you need to work on it. And how do you know, Shiva, if if, um, if it's working? So how, working in the broader sense of the word, right? So the dog's enjoying it. Their health is improving in some way, shape, or form. You know, maybe the you know maybe their stool consistency changes. Like, what 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 should one look for again in the absence of serious health conditions? Yeah. So I mean, the owner would have a much better idea. They know their pet better than anyone else. Um, but you know, obviously the mood and their mood yes you could look at stools and itchy skin it all depends on what you picked up or what yes. those little <laughs> issues that you picked up on whether that's like itchy ears or yeah or stools or just feed intake um you know with the food that you're feeding are they are they wanting to eat more or are they just doing still the bare minimum um to get by so i think pet owners would be the better better judge of that this is obviously excluding conditional issues um so yeah it's once again to repeat it's kind of like a a case by case but for example with my dog I know we're doing well because I'm not getting cow patty style poos out the front and um she's eating her food you know within the 20 minutes of me putting it rather than grazing throughout throughout the day so each owner will have their own parameters that they'll be able to use and go off yeah Brilliant. Mike, what else did you want to cover from a vet's point of view? I've, all of my questions here are all about raw. <laughs> <laughs> no, and um, Chevy, you, you've you've been excellent, and really, you, you've covered, um, I, th- I think, quite a balanced approach um, to um, to what what's an important area. But yeah, certainly for me, you've you've opened my eyes to the value of investing into being quite intentional in this space. And that, yes. the, the, yeah, and that there's there's going to be benefits for it, and and oftentimes we just need that nudge, don't we? Like a reminder, just to you know how much um, I'm I'm interested. I'm looking forward to a, a steak lunch after this, and, that, um, and so as I look at the joy and anticipation that I'm experiencing there, uh, you know, it, it's making me think about well, how much is uh, are my pets are experiencing in that space, yeah. Yeah. and it, it certainly is different between dogs and cats. Cats can tend to be. Pickle. <laughs> they are. Yeah. And and I guess going back as well, I mean, there needs to be so much research in this area. There's there is not near enough research, if really any, but if we kind of want to tie it back to gut health, which is yeah. a big thing, you know, and I've always been fascinated to look at this as well. Well, okay, with fresh food, raw food, you could look at, well, how does that alter, yes, their gut health? How does their behaviour then change? Because we do know gut health does affect mood. Absolutely. It affects behaviour. It affects a multitude of things. Yep. So these are really large-scale studies that 
whoever's got deep pockets to invest in it, please do because it's very fascinating. Yeah. Um, but there's definitely a link, but that's still yet to be scientifically yeah. proven. But from my experience, yes, there is a link between the food that they eat. Obviously, that would change their gut health, like the microbiome and how it and how that would response affect and so their, Yeah, yeah it, it, it plays a big role. Yeah. yeah. So probably, uh, just, uh, sorry, Mike, go ahead. I was just going to say, as, as as we close, it would be good to, if you are able to share any resources, so it, it might be... Um, it might be you know sites that we could visit um, that we we could keep up to date with latest thinking or you know sources of, of information that you value. Um, yeah. It'd be great to share with those with us. Sure. Let me ask one um, one more very loaded question as as the owner of a pet supplement company as well. Um, what's the um, what's the clinical nutritionist perspective on supplementation for pets? Look, it's it's pretty much the same with, with humans too. There is a need for it if there are deficiencies, but it is very yep. easy to over supplement as well, and that they both have their negativities. So, you know, if that can be identified what those deficiencies are, for instance, then yes, supplementation is absolutely necessary. Um, and supplement supplementation is absolutely necessary with, say, raw feeding and fresh food. Ah, like, interesting. Um, uh, you cannot. And I mean, you absolutely cannot do a complete and balanced diet from raw and cooked food without external supplementation being put in. It is, it's just not going to happen. Got it. Um, unless, you know, you really loaded it up, but then the energy density of the food will be too yeah, high. You, and then you've got issues with obesity. Yeah. 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 So um, people that say, oh, I can do it exclusively through, um, diet alone no that is not true yeah yeah it's the same as you say it's the same for humans as well right so that's right you know am i eating what i think the, the now the rule of thumb i was reading last night is nine to twelve serves of vegetables and fruit a day no i'm not yeah. <laughs> am yes. i ever likely to no, no. Absolutely not. <laughs> but yes yeah, supplementations so. definitely do play a role in pet health and should but you need to be mindful, of course, what that is and how much you're giving of it because too much of something is going to have the absolute opposite effect. So, yeah. No, and thank you for that. And, again, I, I guess for, for the point of the view of the listeners and the viewers at home, how do you navigate the mountain of information out there? Is it is it a matter of finding a high-quality animal nutritionist or speaking to your vet or what the, what the heck does someone do? Yeah, I, I I don't look. It's great to do your own desktop research because yep. that allows for when you do have those conversations with an expert, you're able to have a more productive conversation. But don't try and work it out yourself because yeah. there's mm. a lot that you won't understand. Um, you know, there are some vets that have a great interest in nutrition, so you know you, you might want to reach Seek out to them. Yeah. Um, as far as nutritionists go. In Australia, um, with pet nutrition, I don't know of any except myself and perhaps one other veterinary nutritionist, but they're not quite based in Australia. I think they're living overseas. So that's one problem. Um, there's not there's a high it's demand. Not, it's not really. It seems to be more of a, a more of a widely available profession in the States. Is that right? But not that's really right. here. In the yeah. States, yes. Yes. And that's because in the States, They've got so many universities that um, offer animal nutrition, yep. you know, across the country, whereas in Australia, they closed up, they shut up all those degrees. Um, I was the last to do it. So that's all finished up um, and there's nothing more from that. It's just the, the interest wasn't there. So wow. it, wasn't vi it wasn't a viable course to continue. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. I reckon we're going to see a resurgence. Well, I certainly hope we will. Yeah. You know, food, food as medicine is not going away as a paradigm for sure. And, exactly. and it's relevant for us as humans, but it's even more relevant for animals who can't go to the grocery store for themselves. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> you know, like choices for them. Yeah. And, and I find it very difficult too because I'm only one person, but, you know, I'll get bombarded. Like, can I see you? Can I book this? And I bet you do. I only have so much time in a yeah. day um, and I can't meet everyone's um yeah, I, I can't see everyone. I can't meet everyone. So, and that makes it makes me really, really sad. Sometimes I'll quickly try and send an email to provide some guidance or try to find someone else, maybe even the US, to help them. 
Um, but it does make me really sad because there are a lot of pet owners out there that really they want to find the information out. They want to have a conversation so they can do the right thing, but there just isn't enough people to do that. So, yeah. Well, I, you know, I really respect and appreciate the work that you are doing. I think, you know, and it sounds like you're building this expertise and, and I'm absolutely certain you're, you're working towards a platform of some sort um, <laughs> where you can get your, your expertise out on, yes. on a greater scale. So yes. Hopefully, hopefully, yes. hopefully we can be a small part of that process. Yes. Look, I, and I, I'm really thankful that you guys um, reached out and I'd like to build this nutrition community so yeah. people, and you can create accessibility to people with in with the right information. So the more the merrier. Yeah, yeah and I mean, Mike, Mike's way more educated in this space than I'll ever be, but, you know, I've, I've got a reasonable understanding, but trying to cut through yeah. the... Yeah. nonsense out there is just a it's a real task yeah, yeah. um and finding sort of reliable sources of information even if it's as we say science is always evolving what is true today may not be true in three years time but certainly that's that's you know the best we have at this point in time you know i think there's a real need for it absolutely we might be in, we might be in touch to try and <laughs> get that going. <laughs> I would love that. I would love that. Yeah. We wish, I wish you all um, the best, Shiva, and, and love to absolutely. support you again in the future. Thank you very much. It's lovely and, to speak to you both. Um, as Mike said earlier, Shiva, just sorry, as we, as we close, if you can just send us through any links or resources or websites, yes. books that people might want to get their hands on, um, yes. that would be fantastic, and we'll share those yes. in the show notes. All right. Thank you so much for today. Shiva, Doctor, by this time, this this goes to where you'll be Dr. Shiva Greenhold, I'm sure. Um, thank you for your time. We really, really appreciate it and look forward to having you back. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you, Dave. Thank you, Mike. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye.